Welcome back to another video on the English Zone YouTube channel. We're going to continue reading this book, Limitless, by Jim Quick. And this part is about your two brains. Wait, what? We have two brains? Oh, yeah. So we're going to talk about the power of your brain, your limitless brain. We're going to learn about neuroplasticity. And we're going to learn about your second brain. Are you guys ready to read with me? We will start today right here on page 31. Keeping the villains at bay. Keeping the villains at bay. The villains, the bad guys. At bay means far away from you. Keeping something away from you so you do not reach it. And usually it's for something bad. To avoid it. Like keep sugar at bay keep it far away from you in the hero's journey the heroes need villains they need the bad guys just as much as the villains need heroes the challenges from trials and rivals make us grow and become better the power and strength the power and strength of the villain grow and become wait the power and strength of the villain determines the necessary power and strength of the hero it's very true if you don't have struggles if you don't have problems how can you tell if you are a strong or weak person so this is just my interpretation but problems are a good thing they will teach you how to solve them if the villain was weak there would be nothing to vanquish and no need for the hero to rise to greatness. In my podcast interview with Simon Sinek, author of The Infinite Game, Simon refers to our worthy rivals, those who help point out the personal weaknesses we need to address. That is where your opportunity lies. That is where you find your opportunity. Somebody telling you, hey, this is not good for you. You need to change this. You need to change that. Constructive feedback. A mentor to tell you your mistakes and also to empower you for your potential and your strength. As I mentioned, I love the light side of technology. I love the light side of technology. How it can connect us, educate us, and empower us make our lives easier. What we've just described are a few potential drawbacks of technology, which is an inherent part of all the good and it brings into our lives. I'm going to read this one more time. What we've described are a few potential drawbacks of technology which is an inherent part of all the good that it brings into our lives. Drawback. Drawback is something negative, something that pulls you back, like disadvantage. So the potential drawbacks of technology, the negative parts of technology. Like fire, technology has changed the course of human history. However, fire can cook your food or burn your home down. It's all in how you use it. Like any tool, technology itself isn't good or bad, but we must consciously control how it's used. If we don't, then who becomes the tool? It's up to you to choose how you engage. What's the meaning of engage? If you don't use technology to your advantage, then you become the tool. It will be technology that controls you, not you controlling technology. And it's true about anything. You will become the slave of technology. So it's really all about how we use technology. For all of you guys who are here, Thank you for being here. You are here to learn. You're not here to watch 
negative stuff on TikTok. You came across this live session and you are reading with me, which is so powerful. So thank you guys for being here. Please share this video with your friends. Like this video so more people join. The meaning of engage is to become a part of something, to participate in something. So like how you do it. Like it's up to you how to how you engage. It's up to you how you participate. So like if you engage in this uh, live stream, that means you comment, you like the video, you share the video, you are active. And that is the meaning of engage. Quick start. Which of the four digital villains do you believe are currently most disturbing your performance, productivity, and peace of mind. Take a moment and write the name of this villain down. Villain, the bad guy. Villain, the bad guy. So this is a good question. I want to ask you guys, which of the four digital villains do you believe you are currently or do you believe are currently the most disturbing, like not good, distracting your performance, distracting your, your productivity and peace of mind. Conscious awareness is the first part to solving a problem. So think about this question. Is it Facebook? Is it Instagram? Is it Snapchat? Is it uh, TikTok? Which one of these social media platforms uh, is the villain for you? Which one is controlling you? In my opinion, IG is a digital villain. I agree. I agree 100%. But it's all about how you use it. Let's talk about the human brain, guys. This is insane. The human brain has 100 billion neurons. Each neuron connected to 10,000 other neurons. Think about it, guys. Sitting on your shoulders is the most complicated object in the known universe. So more complicated than anything else in the world is your brain. Your brain is your biggest blessing. Your brain is your biggest na'mah your limitless brain. You may be thinking, Jim, I see what you mean about technology. I wouldn't want to live without it, but I do feel more overloaded, overloaded, distracted, and forgetful than ever. Here's the good news. You were born with the ultimate technology, the greatest superpower. Let's take a moment to acknowledge, let's take a moment to realize just how extraordinary your brain is, how amazing your brain is. It generates up to 70,000 thoughts per day. Guys, if you just watch your mind for 30 minutes, you will realize how many different ideas you can you are thinking about even without noticing you're thinking about your family you're thinking about your job you're thinking about oh i wonder what this person is doing oh i wonder what uh, this other person is doing what's going to happen to me tomorrow what's going to happen with my job oh my god we're always thinking Seventy thousand thoughts per day it races with the speed of the fastest race car like your fingerprints it is uniquely yours there aren't two brains in the universe exactly the same it processes dr dramatically faster than any existing computer and it has virtually infinite storage capacity what is infinite finite limited infinite unlimited. It comes from the word infinity, infinity. So basically, 
your brain is unlimited. Your brain is limitless. Even when damaged, it is capable of producing genius. And even if you only have half a brain, you can still be a fully functioning human being. This is the crazy part. Even if half of your brain is damaged, you can still be a fully functioning human being. Imagine a car, like half of the engine not working, you know, that's it. Or another part of it. Everything needs to be functioning for the car to function. There's one error, you need to take it to the mechanic. Of course, if there's a problem, there's a health problem, you have to go to the doctor, but generally, you can still keep going. And remarkable stories about it abound. Like the one about the comatose patient who somehow developed a method of communication with his doctor. I don't know what this comatose patient means. Or the woman who could recall important events by date going back as far as when she was 12 years old. Or the slacker, slacker, somebody who is lazy and who is not doing very well, is called a slacker. If you are slacking, that means you are behind. You're very slow and lazy. Or the slacker who became a mathematical genius after suffering a concussion during a bar fight. Concussion, brain injury. None of this is science fiction or the product of a superhero comic. They're just examples of the extraordinary function built into that remarkable machine between your ears. We take so much of that function for granted. Take something for granted. To take something for granted means to ignore it or to not appreciate something. You can take someone for granted, which is not good. If you take someone for granted, you don't give them the credit they deserve. Maybe they're very kind to you, but you take them for granted. You don't appreciate them. We take our brain for granted. We take our brain for granted. Let's think. Let's think about just what the average person has accomplished simply by being an average person. This word, average, the E is silent. We don't say average. No. Average. Average. I'm not going to forget this expression. Good job. The best way to remember vocabulary is to write it down. Average. By the age of one, you learned how to walk. Like you're only one years old and you learned how to walk. No simple task, considering how many complex neurological and physiological processes are required, are needed to be able to walk. A year or so after that, you learned how to communicate through the use of words and language. You learned dozens of new words and their meanings on a daily basis and kept doing so all the way through school. And while you were learning to communicate, you were also learning to reason. This is a really good word, reason. The difference between to reason and to think is when you reason, you think carefully about something. You try to understand something, not just think about it. So reasoning is a very, very powerful and very important skill. So while you were learning to communicate, you were also learning to reason, to calculate, to parse an endless number of complex concepts. And all of that was before you read a single page of a book or attended one class. Our brains are what separate us from the rest of the animal kingdom. Guys, our brain, our brains are what separate us from the rest of the animal kingdom. 
think about it. We can't fly. We aren't particularly strong or fast. We can't climb with the dexterity of some animals. We can't breathe underwater. As far as most physical functions are concerned, are concerned, we're just average. But because of the power of our brains, we are overwhelmingly Earth's most dominant species. By harnessing that incredible mental power, by using, by taking advantage of this incredible mental power, we have created ways to explore the oceans, to explore the ocean depths like a fish, move tons of weight like an elephant, and even fly like a bird. Yes, the brain is quite a gift. The brain is so complex that we know more about our vast universe than we do about its workings, and we've learned more about it in the past decade than we'd previously learned over the course of human history. And we'll learn even more about, about it from the time this book goes to press to the time it hits the bookshelves. Our understanding of the brain is ever evolving. It's continuous. It's not stopping. Ever evolving, continuously growing. We know that what we've learned about it is only a tiny, very, very small fraction, a very small part of what there is to be learned. What we already know is staggering, is Insane. It's fascinating. It's amazing. Shocking. So let's take a journey through our limitless brain. The brain is a part of the central nervous system, CNS. Similar to the control power at an airport, your brain acts at, as its control center, directing all the comings and goings of information. Processes and information, processes and impulses. The brain has three major areas. So we're learning about the brain, guys. We have three main areas of the brain. The brainstem, the cerebellum, and the cerebral cortex. Both the cerebellum and the cerebral cortex start with cere. Latin for wax, because of its waxy appearance. The brain is made of fat and water. Guys, it's so crazy. Weighs approximately three pounds and facilitates incredible power and ability. The brain stem moderates the basic functions we need to live, such as breathing, maintaining a regular heart rate, impulses to eat or have sex, and our fight or flight responses. Fight or flight response. This is, uh, this is actually a very important uh, phrase, fight or flight. Basically, what fight or flight response is, is an auto, it's an automatic response or reaction that your brain directs your body to do. Like if something falls, right in front of you or or you're driving your car and something really bad happens you immediately like your your brain takes action to protect you so f fight or flight response can be also used in other situations like when you are in danger or when you know that you're in danger you you run away you run away from danger that's your brain taking action it is located at the top of your spine and the base of your skull, buried, covered deep within the brain. At the back of the brain, the cerebellum is responsible for moderating movement and coordination. coordination. There's also increasing evidence that it plays a role in our decision making. The cerebral cortex is the largest part of our brain. 
where the majority of our complex thinking, short-term memory, and sensory stimulation take place. It's made up of the occipital, parietal, temporal, and frontal lobes. We don't need to know those words. Our frontal lobes are where most of our thinking takes place, where logic and creativity come from. So, logic and creativity derive. That's where logic and creativity come from. The brain is split into two halves that are connected by the corpus callosum, which acts like a bundle of telephone wires between the lobes sending messages back and forth. Right now, you have somewhere around 86 billion neurons, also called brain cells. Firing and acting together in concert as you read these words and assimilate the information on these pages. These neural, this neural, 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 these neural, this neural signals are released into the brain and received by neurotransmitters, which then pass the passage along to other neurotransmitters to or stop the passage altogether if that's appropriate response. All right, we need to think that we reached our neurological peak in late adolescence. Sorry, not need to think, we used to think. In the past, we thought that we reached our neurological peak in the late, in late adolescence. Adolescence means before teenage years, like before you become a teenager, uh, adolescence. So up until like, you know, what is it, 12? They used to think that that's it. We, we hit the top growth of our neurological, uh, like our brain was fully grown by the time we hit adolescence. We reached adolescence after which our brains never changed, other than to deteriorate. Now starting to get worse or losing brain cells and all that. We now know that this is far from the truth. Our brains have the capacity for neuroplasticity. This is what I want, was gonna talk about, guys. Neuroplasticity. This is a very, very uh, powerful uh, concept or study of the brain. It's actually a very new, uh, like there's a lot of new research about neuroplasticity, like the shaping of the brain or being able to shape your brain. It's not like your brain will never change after you know, you're a teenager, which means that it can be changed and shaped by our actions and by our environments. So you can change your brain. You can change your brain. Your brain is always changing and molding itself, shaping itself to your surroundings and to the demands you place on it. This is neuroplasticity. Like I said, the new, the new study. The way you change your brain, the way you can shape your brain or influence your brain is you, by your thinking, the way you think. But also the way you think is influenced by what you read, the people around you, what you watch, whether on social media or the news media like the news. First of all, if, if you believe stuff you see in the news, you are in Disneyland. A few things are very, very important. What you think about, what you eat, what you read, what you listen to, the people you spend time with, and uh, what you drink. Why? Because our brains are subject 
to the influence of our genes and environment. We, we each possess a brain, each one of us possesses a brain that is entirely unique to us. They're like snowflakes. No two are similar. No two brains are alike. Each brain adapts to the needs of its owner. Let's look at someone raised in an environment that was full of stressors such as poverty, lack of access to food, or lack of safety. That person will have a very different brain compared to someone compared to someone brought up in a very comfortable, affluent, rich, well cared for setting, well cared for environment or home. But before you jump to the conclusion that one environment is better than the other and breeds a better future functioning brain, I challenge you to reconsider. Reconsider. This is where the interesting part comes in. This is where the interesting part comes in. As I stated earlier, the brain is capable of being molded and shaped meaning that at any point anyone can decide to change the way their brain functions while it's easy to assume that the individual who grew up in a more stressful and supportive environment may not wind up reaching their full potential due to their brain's development under those circumstances growing evidence suggests those people are able to thrive they are able to grow and reach new levels of success due to the mindset they're forced to develop in such a situation. So just because you are not in America or Canada or Australia or some developed country does not mean you don't have the advantage. Think about this. If you are living in a country, you say, oh, I don't have a lot of opportunities. Think about this and realize that the opportunities are all around you. Like you're, you, have, you have access to TikTok, right? You're right here. You're right here. What does that mean? That means you have, if you have access to internet, that means you have access to millions of people around the world and you can make a change or you can become a different person and grow. So, right here. Where was it? I'm forced to develop. Based on the number of successful people who overcame troubled upbringings, troubled childhood, difficult childhood, it may be that a difficult childhood or challenging upbringing breeds resilience, creates resilience, among other attributes, among other qualities that lead to success. Absolutely. The environment where you live have a huge impact on your brain. Danta Hollister, Holistic Healer, thanks for joining. All right. Understanding neuroplasticity. Understanding neuroplasticity. What can we learn from the brains of London taxicab drivers? This is the question neuroscientist Eleanor Maguire of University College of London posed as she considered the vast amount of information held in the brains of the city's cab drivers, appropriately called the knowledge. To learn their licenses, applicants traveled by moped through a specific section of the city a 10 kilometer radius of Charing, of what? Charing Cross Station, Sharing Cross Station, and for three to four years of memorizing the maze of 25,000 streets within as well as the thousands of attractions they supported. Even after this intense study, 
only about 50% of applicants passed their series of license, licensing exams. Perhaps, though, Maguire, uh, though successful, what? Uh, perhaps those successful had larger than average hippocampi. Hippocampi is the part of the brain, or are the, this is the plural of hippocampus. Uh, it's a part of the brain. Maybe we're going to learn. I forgot exactly which part. Hippocampus is, I think, the part that holds memory. Yep. Or, or language. Maguire and her colleagues discovered that Lang London taxi drivers did indeed have more gray matter in their uh, posterior hippocampi than people who were similar in age, education, and intelligence who did not drive taxis. In other words, taxi drivers had plumber memory, plumper, plumper memory centers than their peers. It seemed that the longer someone had been driving a taxi, the larger his hippocampus, as though the brain expanded to accommodate the cognitive demands of navigating London's streets. The London Taxi Cab Study provides a compelling example of the brain's neuroplasticity or ability to re reorganize and transform itself as it's exposed to learning and new experiences. Having to constantly learn new routes in the city forced the taxi cab drivers' brains, it forced their brains to create new neural pathways. These pathways changed the structure and the size of the brain. An amazing example of the limitless brain at work. Neuroplasticity, also referred to as brain plasticity, means that every time you learn something new, your brain makes a new uh, synaptic connection. Every time you learn something new, your brain makes a new synaptic, synaptic connection. Every time you learn something new, your brain makes a new synaptic connection. And each time this happens, your brain physically changes. It upgrades its hardware to reflect a new level of the mind. So all of you guys who are learning English, all of you who are, uh, if I see any of, the, any of that toilet paper flag, I will remove and block. So, all right. Where are we? So for all of you guys who are learning English, you have advantage over somebody who, is, who only speaks one language. Because when you learn a new language, the shape of your brain physically changes because you're learning this complex information, you know? So you should applaud yourself for learning English, for speaking English, for deciding on wanting to grow professionally, personally. So yeah, that is the power of neuroplasticity. Each time this happens, your brain physically changes. It upgrades its hardware to reflect a new level of the mind. Neuroplasticity is dependent on the ability of our neurons to grow and make connections with other neurons in other parts of the brain. It works by making new connections and strengthening or weakening, as the case may be, weakening old ties, weakening old connections. Our brain is malleable. Malleable. Can somebody... Type the meaning of malleable. 
We have the incredible ability to change its structure and organization over time by forming new nor- neural neural pathways as we experience, as we learn something new, and as we adapt. Neuroplasticity helps explain how anything is possible. Researchers hold that all brains, they believe that all, brain, all brains are flexible in that the complex webs of connected neurons can be rewired to form new connections. Sometimes that means the brain compensates for something it has lost. I'm going to read this one one more time. Sometimes that means the brain compensates for something it has lost, as when one hemisphere learns to function for both. Just as there are people who have suffered strokes and have been able to rebuild and regain their brain functions, those that procrastinate, think excessive negative thoughts, or can't stop eating junk food, may also rewire and change their behaviors and transform their lives. Food is the big thing. So what you eat, what you read, what you feed your brain, what you feed your body, all of those, what you feed your eyes, what you feed your ears, all of these affect and shape the personality that you are. It shapes you as a person. If learning is making new connections, then remembering is maintaining and sustaining those connections. When we struggle with memory or experience memory impairment, we are likely experiencing a disconnection between neurons. In learning, when you fail to remember something, View it as a failure to make a connection between what you've learned and what you already know. And with how you will use it in life. So when you don't remember something, that means you did not make a connection with that information. For example, if you feel like something you've learned is valuable in the moment, but that you'll never use it again, you are unlikely to create a memory of it. This is very true. So if you don't think something is important, you're like, yeah, I don't care about this. You are not going to remember it. Similarly, if you learn something, but have no higher reasoning as to why it's important to you or how it applies to your life or work, then it's likely that your brain will not retain that information. So it's like you train your brain. It's totally normal to have a memory lapse. We're human, we're not robots. But if we respond to this lapse in memory with the attitude that I had a bad, I have a bad memory. People say this, you know? They say, oh, I'm not a good I'm not good at learning languages. I'm not a good learner. Everyone has the brain and the capacity to learn. Maybe some people learn faster, some people learn more slowly, but you do not have a bad memory or I'm not smart enough to remember this. We negatively affect our ability to learn and grow when we say this. In other words, the belief we might develop in response to forgetting does far more damage than the lapse in memory. What does that mean? If you try to remember some information or you try to remember something and then you can't remember it, then you're like, ah, man, I can't remember this. I'm just so bad at remembering names. I'm so bad at doing this. This is more negative than the forgetting itself. Why? Because that kind of self-talk reinforces a limiting belief. This kind of self-talk reinforces a limiting belief. 
rather than acknowledging the mistake and reacquiring the information. So if you don't remember someone's name, this is just an example, don't say, oh, I'm so sorry, I, I'm just so bad at remembering names. I'm not good at remembering names. Because you're already showing that you're a weak person. You forget things, right? Instead of that, acknowledge the mistake. Say, oops, I forgot your name. What was your name again? I promise I'll remember it this time. But now you have to use a different technique. Maybe you're going to write their name down or get the number and save their name. Make a connection with that information. Or you say, oh man, I forgot that word. I'm just not good at learning langu languages. Instead of saying that, hmm, I forgot that word. What was it again? I'm going to write this word down. What does this mean for learning? Plasticity means that you can mold, you can shape your brain to suit your desires, to fit your desires. That something, that something like your memory is trainable. When you, when you know how to help your brain receive, encode, process, and consolidate information. It means that with a, new, with a few simple changes to something like your environment, like your food, like your exercise, you can dramatically, you can dramatically change the way your brain functions. I will share these energy tips in detail in chapter 8. This is very true, guys. You need to choose your friends. If you are friends with a bunch of people who drink alcohol, who go out and waste their time and do nothing, there is absolutely no chance that you become something. Absolutely no chance. They will always pull you back. They will always pull you down because you are influenced and you are shaped by your surrounding. There's a reason why alcohol is not allowed in Islam. Because when you drink alcohol, you lose yourself. It means that with a few simple changes to something like your environment, your food, or your exercise, you can dramatically change the way your brain functions. Here's the bottom line. Plasticity means that your learning and indeed your life is not fixed. It's not fixed. Your life is not fixed. It's not set on stone. You can be, you can do, and you can, ha you can have and share anything when you optimize and rewire your brain. Rewire your brain. There are no limitations when you align, when you apply the right mindset, motivation, and methods. So, one, two, three. You need the mindset, you need the motivation, and you need the method, how to get there. Without these, you cannot get where you want to go. Now... We're going to talk about the second brain. What? I thought we had one brain. My students tell me after they learn about the vastness of their brain, they have a whole new sense of worth. They have a whole new sense of value. What they think about themselves. What they believe about themselves. That their self-esteem, their, their self-belief grows overnight. Here's more good news. You are not limited to just one brain. You have a second brain. And what is that? Your gut. Your gut, like your stomach, but we're gonna talk about it. Have you ever had a gut feeling? What is a gut feeling? That moment when you just knew, when you just knew, if you've ever 
gone with your gut to make a decision or felt butterflies in your stomach? Did you ever wonder why that was? Hidden in the walls of the digestive system, this brain in your gut is revolutionizing medicine's understanding of the links between digestion, mood, health, and even the way you think. Gut, your stomach. We have another brain in the stomach. You know, like sometimes you make a decision. You want to go somewhere else or you want to start a new job, but something in your stomach, something in your heart, something is telling you, no, I'm not sure about this decision. Gut feeling is the same as intuition and inner voice. So it's not your brain. Scientists call this little brain the enteric nervous system, ENS. And it's not so little. The ENS is two thin layers of more than 100 million nerve cells. Lining your gastrointestinal gastrointestinal tract from lining your gastrointestinal tract from esophagus to rectum here science is only beginning to understand the brain gut axis and how it affects your brains your your moods your behavior or our brains, our moods, and our behavior. You may hear it referred to as the brain-gut connection. In the last decade, we've discovered that the gut, that the stomach, has an outsized effect on the way our brains function. One can liken it to the way a tree functions. The roots in the ground are drawing up vital nutrients and water from the soil as well as communicating with other plants. Those nutrients are then brought up into the body of the tree, fortifying, making it strong, building the trunk and giving the tree what it needs to sprout, what it needs to grow, new leaves each spring, which in turn gather light, of course, another energy source. That's why we have the leaves. The leaves bring light to the tree. In the same way, the nutrients we take, we take in are absorbed through our intestines, intestines. We rely, we depend on those nutrients to fuel our brains. That's why we say what you become, what you eat, because the food you eat affects your brain function. That's why like health is the one of the biggest issues in America, in the West, because of all the junk food people eat that affects their mood, it affects their health, they become overweight. And when you become overweight, it affects your thinking, it affects your brain, it affects everything. The food, guys, the food. Please be careful. What's this? We need this. We need this, guys. Have you ever had a pomegranate? I actually made a video about this. If you go to my Instagram, you'll see a video about pomegranate. Let's continue learning about the second brain. In the same way, the nutrients we take are are, uh, taken, are absorbed through our intestines. We rely on those nutrients to fuel our brain. While our brain take up very little of our total body weight, they use 20% of the energy we take in. So nutrients make a huge difference in the way our brains function on a day-to-day basis. So the brain uses a lot of energy, guys. So if we don't feed our brain good stuff, all that junk food is still going to go to the brain because the brain needs energy, but the brain is going to be getting negative energy. The gut is lined with more than 100 million nerve cells and it makes up part of the ENS. When a baby grows in the womb, in the tummy of the mummy, (laughs) 
The ENS and the CNS develop from the same tissue and they remain connected via the vagus nerve. They also both use many of the same neurotransmitters to function, including serotonin, dopamine, and uh, this thing. I don't know, acetylcholine, whatever the word is. As with CNS, we used to believe CNS, what does CNS stands for? Uh, we talked about it. Where was it? CNS. Does anybody remember what CNS stands for? That we are each born with a certain amount of cells and that's, that's it. But like the brain, we now know that ENS makes new neurons throughout adulthood and can be repaired when damaged. The gut is made up of those neurons as well as a network of bacteria that form the microbiome. And as with the brain, each of us has our own unique microbiome. I guess that's the word. Yeah, central nervous system. Thank you, Zario. What's more, these nerves, these nerve cells operate through startlingly, start, what? Startlingly, startlingly, startlingly. Comes that comes from the word startle. I don't like this word the way like I like it as a verb. Startle means to shock someone or to surprise someone. But startlingly, startlingly. Startlingly. Operate through startlingly cells of the gut at foot like protrusions. You see, guys, I have 11 years of teaching experience, teaching English, and I still have trouble with a lot of vocabulary words. What does that mean? That means there's always more to learn and some words are so long you're right we don't need those words if it's not if i'm not a doctor if i'm not a medical uh, professional i don't need to learn or you know know these words i don't teach stuff that's not very commonly used and very useful so this word you uh, discovered that the this cells the cells of the gut had foot like protrusions that resembled the synapses that neurons use to communicate, looked like, resemble. This caused similar signals, or this caused signals similar to the way neurons do. He hypothesized, he believed, he thought. He had this theory that if this Team effort. The connection between the brain and the gut is still being explored, but it seems that they function in very similar ways and that they function in tandem. The little brain in conjunction with the big one partly determines our mental state. When you have a gut feeling that isn't right, or conversely, Conversely means like oppositely, in the opposite way. Or conversely, that you should follow a hunch. You should follow um, a quick, what is a hunch? I forgot. It's not just superstition. Your gut has its way of interpreting events and giving your brain signals. Furthermore, when you feel your when you feed your gut with subbar food, you are also feeding your brain with subbar fuel, just like I was saying earlier. So, right now your gut is digesting the food you just ate and sending that fuel to your brain. At the same time, a part of your brain is taking 
in the feel of the pages under your fingertips or your e-reader if that's your ref preference that means it's taking this information to your brain you know sensing the comfort of the chair supporting you and monitoring the environment around you to make sure you're safe another part of the brain is taking in the smells of the environment maybe coffee or perfume or the scent of the book's pages another part of the brain is absorbing is taking in the word symbols of the page on the page of this book turning them into meaning which is then processed and stored in short-term memory where it will then be sent to long-term memory under the right conditions which you'll get will get it will get to in a moment all of this is to say that you have the ultimate superpower between your ears you have the ultimate superpower between your ears I'm going to repeat this all of this is to say that you have ultimate power ultimate superpower between your ears you also have the ability to hone that superpower and make it greater or to let it falter to let it make mistakes to let it fail and decay you get to decide what kind of environment your superpower lives in one that supports your mission in life or one that distracts you from your greatest dreams you get to decide guys you are the one who makes the decision you get to decide what kind of environment your superpower lives in one that supports your mission in life or one that distracts you from your greatest dreams so for those of you for all of you that are here you are here because you want to change something inside you is pushing you to become a better person to grow and i congratulate you i i applaud you for being here